Rising temperatures and lightning in the Pacific Northwest are priming force in the region for new wildfires. In recent years, wildfires have become increasingly larger and are spreading faster. According to the National Interagency Fire Center, there are 82 large fires burning in 13 states right now. And environmental experts say this is only the beginning. A new documentary is shedding light on the causes and solutions to a global wildfire epidemic. It's called Bring Your Own Brigade, and it tells the story of survivors, firefighters, scientists, and others who warn of the nation's misguided fire suppression policies. Watch. Never seen anything like it. The fire equivalent of an ice age. Like peering into Dante's Inferno. And it's only going to accelerate. This is only a beginning. We're surrounded by fire. My dad put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't leave. Whatever you do, do not let that building burn down. Evacuate. Everything was on fire. The looks on their faces, they were sure they were going to die. Run for your life. I've never seen that look in anybody's face. For more on this, I want to bring in Oscar-nominated director of Bring Your Own Brigade, Lucy Walker. Uh, Lucy, it's so good to see you. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So you spent years making this film, and we were talking about this in the break. Um, explain to our viewers what pushed you to pursue this and get the story out to a broader audience besides audiences that just watch the news because this was a big news story but if you weren't paying attention to the news because you were focused on other things like perhaps the pandemic you might not have been aware of what was happening out west that's right and actually around the world though the, this is really a global fire crisis with australia even places like siberia that you wouldn't expect to burn uh, there's really been an explosion of um, wildfire activity on all continents horrifyingly and it got my attention when I moved to California. I'm originally from London, had also lived in New York City, and they don't seem to have a fire problem there. You don't think of fire as a modern problem. You think of it as kind of a medieval problem that we've solved. In the UK, the last giant fire we had there was the Great Fire of London in 1666. And so I moved to California and the hillside is on fire, there's ash falling down, you know, you're driving up the freeway and yet there are these huge wildfires and there's smoke everywhere. And I thought, my gosh, why don't they just put them out? And it was this kind of naive question. But sometimes when you kind of tug on that naive question, you, you, you're, you're pulling on it for a reason. And I think it was because I intuited that I didn't, there was a bigger story that I didn't understand. And I set about trying to understand this whole problem. And that has taken years uh, to not just understand it, but to craft it into a movie that's hopefully really watchable. Hmm. Let's talk about the title of the film, Bring Your Own Brigade. So as we continue to see, to see worsening wildfires out west, a growing number of wealthy people are hiring their own teams of private firefighters to protect themselves. Um, talk to us about that, because people may not be aware what the title means and what's actually happening out there. That's right. In the movie, we have a little piece of uh, Kim Kardashian and her and Kanye's house was saved by their private firefighters. And it kind of comes up in the film that, you know, how do we feel about this, that the people who can afford to have their own firefighters are gonna be the people that can keep their homes and keep living in these stunningly beautiful places, but that burn all the time. And I think the title also refers to more than just that. It refers also to this idea of, you know, are we on our own or are we gonna to come together as a community to tackle these bigger problems? Because a problem like the wildfires, a little bit like climate change or the pandemic we're seeing, it's, it's not something that we can solve individually without coming together. And you kind of see this dramatically play out during the film. So on one hand, we have extremely wealthy people who are actually able to afford their own fire brigade, but then we also, you also focus on a group that's often unrepresented or underrepresented in film, indigenous people. And I want to play a bit of what one tribal practitioner told you. On November 8th, when I saw the fire itself, I stopped on the side of the road and watched it. It reminded me of the first fire stories. The first fire story is a story of fire that sweeps across the landscape. It's the one that destroys everything. Then you have nothing left. You're devastated. 
and I thought, our society is experiencing the first fire stories that indigenous peoples know about and then learn to use fire. So Lucy, what did you learn from speaking to some of those tribal, tribal leaders um, on how they see this crisis? That's right, it was a fascinating journey to go on when I made the film and to realize that actually indigenous people have a different relationship with fire than we have. Um, where, you know, we're trained to think, I think, that fire is the enemy and uh, Smokey the Bear, you know, that, that every fire is a problem and you should put out every fire. Um, whereas, in fact, uh, Native Americans used to often deliberately set fire or think of fire as a tool. They were fire farmers. They used fire in so many aspects of daily life and often set fires deliberately, in part, actually, to protect settlements so that when naturally uh, fires came along, already the fuel had been burned away, and so it wouldn't set fire to structures where they were living. And I think that when Europeans came uh, and, uh, you know, just didn't recognize the wisdom and advanced technologies that Native Americans were using as they managed their land, we really um, set ourselves back and I think that the film actually wakes us up to a new way of living with fire that recognizes that landscapes like in the western United States are going to burn all the time and it's about managing that rather than trying to eliminate or suppress all the fires which actually if you keep putting the fires out you're stacking up all these fuel and that fuel is going to burn so that when there is a ignition of some kind of lightning or even in the news, uh, uh, as you know, we've had gender reveal parties, all kinds of different ways, that have, things that have sparked fires. And when um, there's so much fuel, those fires are going to burn so much hotter and so much more out of control. And, and we're going to see these giant, um, enormously devastating fires that we're seeing these days. Um, and uh, I want to sort of continue along that line um, because one of the things that I loved about your film and why I want everybody who's watching us now to go out and see it is it takes a subject that, you know, depending on where you are and who you are, you might already have an opinion about it, especially if you've seen news reports the last couple of years of wildfires breaking out all around the world. But, but your film actually does something which is what all great films do, which is it sort of upends what you might think going into the theater to watch the film, right? Um, you, we've heard environmental experts say that these wildfires are burning out of control, primarily due to climate change. But you show viewers another side, uh, that these fires, that the causes uh, of these fires isn't really talked about that often. And it's about what you were just talking about, forest management and lumber practices. So I want to play a bit of that for our audience, and then we'll talk about it. Climate change, in a lot of ways, is a distraction from the issue of fire, because paradise was going to burn whether there was climate change or not. Even if climate change miraculously went back to the 1960s level, we would still have a fire crisis. Climate change is undoubtedly aggravating fire problems. It's a major factor. It's a performance enhancer, but it is not the only thing. So that was really surprising. And also, you have some really cool moments in the film where you show um, older photos, photographs from 100 years ago of the region. And then you cut to what the region looks like now. And I had no idea. In my mind, I thought that the trees that we see out there um, were trees that were just there naturally. But that's not the case. And that's a big part of what those voices are talking about in the clip we just played. That's right. I mean, for me, it was a journey that was full of astounding revelations. And, and there was so much I realized that I didn't know. And also I realized that kind of I was part of the problem as a European immigrating to California and looking at this landscape and mistaking it for being similar to Europe, which is a totally different kind of a place and doesn't burn regularly. I realized that I was sort of part of the problem. And, and it, it was just fascinating to go down that journey of realizing that climate change, which I'd originally assumed was the problem, um, wasn't. There was more to the story. And I'd assumed that because we've had these hottest ever, record-breakingly hot summers, we've had these record-breakingly biggest fires, I assumed that that correlation meant causation. 
And so it was really stunning to start to learn these other factors. And that's really good news, actually, because it means we can do something about it. There are several factors where we can really stop this fire problem. And I think we really want to do that because, of course, the loss of life and property is just devastating. So, so, but, so I guess, Lucy, even if, it's, even if climate change is just one piece of this puzzle, um, and another piece of the puzzle is what we're talking about here. The reality, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the reality is that what is happening there in Australia and in other parts of the world is, is man-made, right? And if it's man-made, that means man and women can fix it. But it is man-made. That's right. You think it's kind of inevitable, but actually it's not. And there are things that we can do. And one of them that you picked up is certainly the... Um, the controlled burn or the prescribed burn, the Native American practice of deliberately setting smaller fires that are controlled to prevent, prevent the pileup of fuel or trees so that when a fire does come along, there's less. And there's, we also do some real investigation in the film into the logging industry practices. Um, there's a lot of land in the campfire in Paradise, which is the deadliest fire, and actually right next to where the Dixie fire is burning right now. A lot of that land is, is actually under the management of a logging company, and we look at that as a factor as well and, and think about how we're using the land and also how we're building and where we're building. It turns out that you can actually build homes that when the fires do burn through, they don't burn down and your belongings are safe and your home is safe. We can have, there have been fires where you've had a 98% home survival rate, which sounds much better than, um, for example, the tragedy of the Paradise Campfire, which uh, burned so many homes in, in that town. And we follow in the film, we follow these characters, the residents and the responders and the town <coughs> officials, as they go through the process of rebuilding after the fire as well. And you see how, unfortunately, the problem gets perpetuated um, in the building codes and the planning process. Um, and we kind of follow the money, which was just astounding. Uh, I, I was really shocked to kind of learn that was so much more to the story than I'd originally understood. Mm. Um, one last question. Uh, you, you know, you, we hear your voice. Uh, I mean, you voice over the film, but we hear you oftentimes interacting with some of these fascinating characters um, that you've encountered. And uh, there was one moment um, when we were talking to somebody um, about the poss uh, about why these fires are occurring, and they asked you if you were from New York, um, which I thought was interesting because because the, the the notion was that you're an outsider, that you just don't get it. It's not climate change. It's just the way things are. And because you're not from around these parts, how would you be expected to know? Um, is that your preferred technique as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker, to sort of have your voice um, and for the audience to hear you sometimes interacting with some of the subjects? Not at all. Actually, it's the first time I've ever used my own voice. I'm a little bit shy and I prefer hiding behind the camera for sure. But this one, because I felt that my journey of understanding more deeply a problem that I initially had had kind of backwards, I felt that that might be a really good um, sort of structuring device, beginning, middle and end for the movie and actually help audience members kind of create this cohesive picture out of it is a, it is a confusing issue. and. I'm really excited that we got to the bottom of it. I've really set out to really understand the issue, to really get our heads around the issue because people are dying and we want to get it right. I felt very responsible to really um, understanding it properly. Um, and to put myself in the film, I think felt the most honest, but also kind of um, compelling way to do that. And yeah, there are some scenes where you really see me kind of outside of my own bubble, meeting people that have very different views to me. And that was actually really, a uh, great one of the great advantages or great privileges of the making of the film i would say because it was through meeting these people that are different from me and and kind of reckoning with our different points of view and how perhaps the our inability to come together was making the problem worse because we really need to get together to solve these problems together and 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 you can see in the film how that turns out to be really challenging but also it was really encouraging to me that i, I managed to make friends and get past our differences and um and meet some really incredible people residents and first responders and really learn their story and i think we all learned a lot from each other which i think we all need to do around such a you know challenging issue for for us all right now 
Indeed. Uh, Lucy Walker, uh, what a fascinating discussion. What a fascinating film. Um, you and I are going to continue our conversation later this evening at the New York City premiere of Bring Your Own Brigade, which is going to be exciting. And folks, if they are following us on social media, can uh, sign up to attend the premiere tonight um, in Brooklyn. So I'm looking forward to that chat later this evening. Thank you very much. I'll see you tonight. Thank you. I can't wait. All right, and you can watch the full trailer for Bring Your Own Brigade on cbsnews.com slash brigade. The documentary, as we said, will debut in theaters on August 6th and will be available right here on CBSN and on Paramount Plus starting August 20th.